Well, good afternoon and welcome along to The Pastor's Heart. My name's Dominic Steele. It's great to have you with us. Now, next week on this program, we're going to be joined by Tim Clemens and Stuart Starr. They're both young ministers who've thought really well about how to do the whole church vision thing. And um, I'm really looking forward to being sharpened by them and uh, really spurred on in how to communicate the vision, how to raise the funds, all that kind of thing we're going to be talking about on The Pastor's Heart next week. So I hope you'll join us 2 o'clock next Tuesday or on the podcast after that. Um, But this week we're talking with the Dean of Students of Moore Theological College, Paul Grimmond. How are you, Dominic? A very old friend and very good to have you with us. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. Mate, um, you... We're talking here about the pastor's heart, yep. and um, and each week we've mostly do we've been doing kind of skills sharpening each other. Sometimes talking theology, but each time we've asked our guest to share something of their heart, something of their journey with God, a place where God has ministered to them in the darkness or something like that. Yep. And uh, as I was thinking, it just completely jumped out at me. He wrote the article: "Do not be anxious about anything." Is that all? Yep. And what else does God say? Yep. And I figured you're right on topic. We'll get you in today <laughs> <laughs> and talk about anxiety, depression, those kind of things. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, so well, we've got some things to say from the scriptures, but why don't you just share some of your story first? Yeah, yeah. sure. So, I mean, uh, it's funny, isn't it? You look back now at things that happened to me even as a teenager, which I didn't understand at the time. So, um, as a kind of early teenager, I remember lying in my bed in the darkness. This was before I'd even come to know Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were moments, particularly thinking about death and eternity and my finite mm-hmm. nature, um, that led me to get just desperate. Like I'd lie in bed and I'd find myself freaking out and just desperately trying to make thoughts go away and breathing too fast and my body feeling out of control. Uh, I didn't know what to call those things at that time. Uh, but it turns out, as I learned much later in my life, that they were probably mini panic attacks mm-hmm. um, was really what they were. So I have a, I have a kind of bodily predisposition uh, to anxiety. And there are certain situations that mean my stomach starts to churn a lot and I start to kind of feel a bit lightheaded and a whole bunch of other stuff happens to me. Um, but the big issue for me really was as I got into my kind of mid to late 20s and as I became more responsible for stuff and ministry got busier and whatever, it was really leading into the birth of our first child actually that I was in a place where I was feeling quite kind of emotionally fried uh, and flat but also struggling with anxiety that I had another string of these attacks. So mm-hmm. I'd have these little pains in the side of my head, which the doctors describe as ice pick pains, which kind of gives you a feel for what they are. They mm. last for kind of five or 10 seconds, really sharp pain and goes away. But my bodily response to that would then be to get very anxious and I would worry about have I got a tumor or whatever. And that would often spark and half an hour, an hour, two hours worth of feeling nauseous, lightheaded, unsettled, all of that kind of stuff. Um, was that stress related or yeah it was it's a stress reaction it's an mm-hmm. anxiety reaction so my body responds to this starts to get anxious and then all the stuff that stress does it lowers your blood pressure it heightens your adrenaline it does all that kind of stuff which gives you a whole bunch of other symptoms that kind of go with that mm-hmm. and so uh, at a certain point in my third year at at more when i was studying there as a student um, I remember being at a friend's place and having another one of these attacks and lying on their floor, but this time it became a full-blown panic attack. So um, what happens is that as you kind of over-breathe, which I didn't realize that I was doing, um, all the body chemistry changes, so I had this tight band across my chest and running down both of my arms, and I was kind of seized up, and I was lying on their floor as they rang the ambulance, and I, I thought, this is it, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to die. <laughs> um, I'm sure that this is what a heart attack feels like. Um, the ambulance came, they calmed me down, everything got kind of sorted out. They said, no, we think it's just this anxiety thing. Um, it's a bit weird. Um, a couple of days later, had another attack, ended up in hospital. And then in hospital, I developed uh, what I was to later be told was called a conversion disorder, um, which I know for a, for a pastor, right, to have a conversion mm. disorder. Um, but what that means is basically that um, while I was in hospital, I developed these kind of physical ticks and jerks yeah. and mannerisms in response to loud noises that mm-hmm. went on from outside me. So the phone would ring and my f- limbs you would jump. kind of flail right. into the air and I would jump and I would kind of, and it was all, it felt completely involuntary to me. Um, and so I, I spent about a week in hospital while they ran every test known to humanity 
uh, and basically the result of all those tests were that there was nothing particularly wrong. And so uh, it was really in God's kindness, uh, I went and saw a very old school psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And he sat me down and he said, Paul, I just want you to know there is no mechanism in your body that is able to be physiologically diseased in a way that explains what is happening to you. And basically what he was saying was that um, the anxiety, the stress, my body and whatever, it just finds physical ways of manifesting that self uh, and in weird kind of responses to external stimuli. So I had this weird thing where my body was doing things that I felt completely out of control of and I'd feel deeply anxious and stressed about things uh, and sometimes that would result in these faint spells and the uh, kind of sense of feeling a bit like you're having a heart attack or whatever else. Uh, and slowly over time I learnt to kind of make some sense of that, understand what was going on with my body chemistry, try to um, learn how to deal with that and how to kind of manage myself and my emotions in that state. Mm. Um, that so anxiety I've got, I've stuff. I've got, I've got two yeah, questions. Go. Yeah. Um, one is, I mean, uh, did it was it situational, like just before a big talk or something like that? Or yeah. um, for me, it wasn't particularly. So, what would spark these pains in the side of the, my head? I didn't know. There was no, there was no particular trigger or no particular stuff. It was really probably a long-term sense of very heightened underlying stress levels, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, getting to the point where I was having some physical symptoms, which may not even have been anxiety related, mm -hmm. but those things would then start me thinking about my health and whether I had a brain mm -hmm. tumour and etc. And then my whole body's response to that sense of, is this serious? Mm -hmm. Am I going to die? That kind of stuff. Um, my body would then go into overdrive in its kind of anxiety response and I would have these attacks and whatever. Mm. But then, I mean, I mean, I knew you at uni. Yep. But, but didn't and then wasn't actually that close to you for the next 10 years or something sure. but th I just watched from a distance as you went into the job of what looked to me like the super stressful job of taking over from <laughs> Philip Jensen at the University of New South Wales and the chaplaincy I did do that Bible yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just thinking was that a smart move <laughs> <laughs> well it's always the wisdom of hindsight isn't yeah. it Dominic I mean uh, like um, uh, I just did a conference recently uh, where someone asked me, you know, what would you say to your kind of 25-year-old 20 20 20 self? <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, I would say, don't take the job. Um, but there's something about being that age and stage that makes you feel still bulletproof. And right. so I don't, I don't think I was old enough or had the maturity or self-awareness or wisdom to realize what it was mm -hmm. that I was entering into. Um, and with the wisdom of where I am now, I probably would say to myself, you know, maybe that wasn't the space that you should have been mm -hmm. in. Um, but in another way, the only way that I've come to be where I am right now is because I've been through a whole lot of other experiences. Of complexes, in the yeah. So, you know, in that job, as I tried to kind of pedal faster and faster and faster to keep the whole thing functioning mm. and working, like I was two years out of college when I took on the job. Mm. Every sermon that I'd ever preached, everybody in the ministry had already heard. Mm. So I was kind of preparing often two talks a week. Um, I was running a big staff team. I inherited a thing which had a budget of over a like million, a million and a half dollars a year. Mm. Um, we were in financial difficulty. Um, there was just there was a lot going on. As I took the job, my um, my father-in-law was diagnosed with a brain tumor. So my first year in the job, he was slowly passing away. We had two small children, um, and so look, the next kind of five years or so was just manic. And the end point of that was that with my anxious personality and tendencies. I ended up being completely burnt out. I got to the point where I was just emotionally fried and personally fried. Um, and it got to the point where for my good and for my family and for the ministry, I needed to pack up and go and do something else mm. for a while. Yeah. Mm. You, you then went and worked for Matthias Media, which I presume was karma. It was... <laughs> <laughs> um, look, that was that was a real gift of God, actually. Yeah. Uh, Tony Payne had been a dear friend and who had loved and cared for me and looked after me through the process. We were actually meeting up in order for me to say to Tony, look, I think I need to leave the job. What's your wisdom? Mm -hmm. And that morning, someone had walked into his office at Matthias Media and said, look, um, I think I'm going to leave the job. And so he came to me and made me a job offer at a meeting that I thought was just going to be about him Encouraging me. Yeah, yeah, shoulder. yeah, that's right. <laughs> kind of saying, you know, what's the next step? So that was just God's uh, really kind provision at that yeah. moment in time. And that was a, it was just, it was a really different pace. It was a different kind of work. Uh, and what that allowed me to do was actually take some steps back. Mm -hmm. uh, I went and saw a counsellor. 
Uh, my wife and I went and saw a counsellor together. We started to kind of unpick some of the stuff about personality and who we were and things that had driven some of these things over time such that, you know, I've learnt things about myself now that I didn't know before mm -hmm. and become aware of. Like this, I have a deep-seated kind of somatic bodily response to conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the prospect of conflict or disagreeing with people um, does a lot to me internally, bodily, mm. um, which I've become much more aware of. And I realised that my instant response to that was to run away from anything that might disagree or have conflict with people, mm -hmm. which is a rubbish situation for somebody who wants to be a pastor mm. <laughs> or for someone who wants to lead a ministry team and I all mean, that kind of stuff. it does make you a really so. nice guy. <laughs> 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 sure, but it was I don't think it was healthy in the end for the ministry and it wasn't healthy for other people. It wasn't healthy for me either. So, you know, part of tackling this problem is realising that although I can't control all of it, I've needed to learn that there are things about me and things that are unhealthy and unhelpful and sinful about me, like pleasing people and wanting to avoid conflict, that I need to overcome some of if I'm going to get better at loving people and being a kind of faithful servant of Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and I presume you went back into the campus Bible study ministry. Um, I did, yeah. As a as a two IC, yep. But with less of the responsibility, and that was a a better season. Yeah, yeah a much better season. Um, there were two things that had happened. The stint at Matthias Media had given me a significant set of tools, um, personally, that mm. I started to use in practice in mm. terms of relationships and whatever. And the role was slightly different in terms of the nature of the stresses and the places of the stresses were just things that I was better at managing and coping with. And I started to do better at some of those things like saying no to people, uh, not taking on every pastoral problem under the sun, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go to the scriptures. Tell us, <laughs> I started with, you wrote this article, do not be anxious about yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah sure. So what, what if, we'll put it up on the screen and you can talk to us about Philippians chapter 4 for a sec. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> um, I mean, look, so whenever you talk about anxiety with Christians, mm. the first thing that comes up is kind of this, you know, well, I know what the verse is. It's Philippians chapter 4 yeah, verse that, that's 6. Where I should that's go. where I should go. <laughs> and it says, don't. <laughs> do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With be totally cool. That's right. Be stoic, yep. be Plato. That's exactly right. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's a command... And it's a command from God. Um, you've either got you're either obeying it or you're not. Yeah. And if you're feeling anxious, then you're not. So I shouldn't and have emotions if I'm going to be Christian. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, it, but it's fascinating, isn't it? Our, our response to those commands. Sorry, and even just now, to be clear, I was joking. No, no, I, I, I know you're joking. Um, but our response to those things is really fascinating. So, um, I want to be a godly Christian. God tells me not to be anxious. I don't seem to be able to do that. Therefore, I'm not a godly Christian. So even at one level, I want to just ask the question, you know, are all commandments in the Bible uttered in the same tone mm -hmm. and in the same way and in the same voice? You know, just as, as I parent my children, and when they're about to tear onto the road and there's a car flying down the street, I'll say, don't run on the road. Um, but that's not quite the same way as I sit beside them and kind of go, you know, don't tip over your glass of water or mm. um, learn to be a bit more gentle with your brother. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we utter different commands with different tones, mm -hmm. even. And so even thinking about this command, you know, is this a do not be anxious or else kind of a command? Mm -hmm. Or is it, is it much more of actually a gentle exhortation? Do not be anxious, but pray. So mm -hmm. even the fact that he offers the alternative at this point in time, which is not true, I don't think, of all the places that the Bible offers commands. Um, don't be anxious, but pray. Or you might even express it, if you're feeling anxious, come to God and bring those things to God in prayer. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I would say, that those kind of, those commandments that we read about, do not worry, do not be anxious, they're actually, I think, the gracious, tenderly care of a father uh, who longs for us to understand who we are in Christ and who we have in him. And therefore, it's possible to bring our cares and concerns to him. And he's gently kind of encouraging us and reminding us that that's the case. Um, but the second thing I think I'd want to say about those verses is we go, don't be anxious, and we go to all the do not verses. Mm. But interestingly, that word, or at least the underlying Greek word, um, is used all the way through the New Testament and sometimes completely in the opposite way from that. So uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Yeah, so in, in yeah. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Um, where, when Paul's talking about the body, at one stage, he says there, should be, there shouldn't be divisions in the body, but every part should have an equal concern for another part of the body. Right. That concern word is exactly the same word that's translated as anxious back in Philippians 4.6. Be concerned, 
don't be concerned. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you would translate 1 Corinthians 12 literally, yep. have no division in the body, but have an anxiety each part for the other, or be anxious for each, for each other. other. Yeah. You know, um, or you know. So it's a. I've got a command: be anxious about something, and then I've got another command: do not be, be anxious. anxious about anything. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you've studied it. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I want to I want to kind of push it even a bit further. So in Philippians two, um, when Paul's talking we'll about, I think too. it's going to come yeah. up on the screen. And um, when he's talking about Timothy, yeah, um, he actually says, "Isn't this remarkable? I have no one else like him who will show genuine anxiety for your welfare." So Timothy's anxiety for the welfare of the Philippians is actually a positive Christian trait. Right. It is encouraged and held up as an example of godliness. Well, you were telling the story about feeling anxious about the ministry and the people in the ministry. Yeah, that's right. So, so you take that line in Philippians as a commendation? It's a, I mean, it's a really good question. I think I do want to say to people that there are right anxieties or concerns that we have as Christians and as, because as, we as love pastors, Jesus. We are going to be concerned Look, about the flock. Yeah. Absolutely. And so if you see someone that you know who's not Christian and you're explaining the gospel to them and they're rejecting it, there's a right sadness mm. and anxiety and unsettledness about that. Mm. Or if you're pleading with somebody in your congregation to put off sin, you mm. know, here's a serious thing that's mm. going on in your life and you're watching them say no... Then, you know, Paul says in another place, you know, um, 2 Corinthians, where he mm. says, I have this burden for the churches. I have a constant, a the word mm. is anxiety. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. word. He said, on top of everything else, I have this burden or this anxiety for the churches. And I think that that's a right apostolic desire for God's people to love Jesus and to live faithfully and well in the world. And so at, at just one basic level, I want to say, there is an anxiety, there are right anxieties that grow out of knowing Jesus and understanding the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even God in his gentleness, I think in Philippians 4, would say, well, Paul, keep bringing those anxieties to me in prayer as well. But the, the, the basic emotion of anxiety or feeling anxious about things is sometimes a right response to truth rather than an ungodly response or a sinful response. Mm. Other verses? Um, like I think for me as I've thought about it and I uh, wrestle with the different verses that we've just talked about there what they give me is this picture of both kind of um, uh, there's something unhealthy and unhelpful that I need to be encouraged out of in terms mm -hmm. of my anxiety but there's something real and good and right that expresses that in the world uh, and as I've tried to make sense of that I think I've kind of tried to think theologically about that question mm. I guess let me just bounce an idea off you um, I feel like in my early Christian life, my models of godliness, really the preachers I looked up to, yep. um, uh, in terms of certainly in terms of their public persona as I saw them, I didn't really see their emotions, and they didn't really tell me in their sermons that they had emotions. Yep. And so, I think I thought that godliness was really just ultimate self-control, no emotion almost platon platonic, do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so the stoicism that we were, you were talking about we were earlier, talking about, yeah. if, I can, if I can cut myself off completely from my emotions, y then I'm able to be godly. Yeah, that's right. And it was, it was much later that I, that I came to see that actually right through the Gospels, Jesus is a highly emotional person, do you know? Extremely, yeah. Um, yeah. And I thought, oh, I've been beating myself up wrongly um, thinking that this that this behavior pattern was godly when actually that wasn't godly you know yeah yeah um, and it's interesting isn't it like you think of Jesus weeping mm. over Jerusalem is that appropriate or in it like surely of course that's it's appropriate, appropriate yeah. or, or, but even in the garden of Gethsemane um, the words used are like uh, he was grieved deeply mm. in his heart as he looks at the cross and cries out, you know, Father, please take the cup, but not mm. my will, but yours. There is, there, there is deep pain and hurt and sorrow and anguish as he sits in that place mm. and wrestles with the reality of obeying his Father and going to the cross for us. Um, there's a very actually deeply emotional portrait of Jesus that the Gospels paint. Mm. 
Uh, and, and I think, actually, uh, the whole of the New Testament, when it calls on us to be Christian, it's not just calling us to have right thoughts, but to have kind of godly emotions. Mm. So when it calls on us to be joyful, uh, or when it calls on us to have compassion on one another or whatever, they're not just an intellectual kind of response to the world. They're a genuine emotional mm. response to the world. And that's part of being human and in this body, but it's also actually part of God, I think. Mm. Yeah. We had a dinner the other night um, where uh, there's a group of senior ministers and Peter Jensen was the speaker. And uh, he made two observations in his address. He said uh, he thought our generation of ministers was the most gifted, equipped, uh, maybe not gifted, but certainly equipped, resourced, trained, sure. best trained yep. generation that he could ever remember. But he also thought the most fragile generation. Um, and and I think he was talking mental health. He was talking about these kind of things. Sure. Um, uh, what do you want to say? I mean, I presume you opening up in your story and... I mean, you've done it today, but you've done it on platforms before, and sure. you've done it in articles before. Yep. More people have come to talk to you, therefore, yep. about their stories. Yep. You know, what, what do you, what's, you've got some observations? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it is interesting. Like, I think, um, in part, um, there is a rightness about what Peter says. So I, I would say that I think that there is, at times, a certain fragility about us um, I was laughing when I read Chapo's, uh, I haven't read all of it yet, but the recent book on mm -hmm. Chapo yep. and kind of through the sermon critique section yeah. and just remembering how absolutely blunt <laughs> Chapo was, <laughs> like you kind of walk in and that one story where he kind of plays the tape for three minutes and presses stop and he says, have we started yet, brother? And then he presses <laughs> play again and waits for another three minutes and he stops and he goes, have we started yet? Um, like he, there I, was was no... one, I was with him one day and he said to him, like, what you said was true but it needs major work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I do wonder whether sometimes we're so precious with each other um, that you, you're not allowed to say any of those things. You know, you've got to be absolutely affirming. And when there are things that are genuinely problematic, and you've just got to say, no, that's wrong, or you've got to fix that up. And, and maybe we could do with a little more kind of bluntness around yeah. some of that stuff. Um, but I also do wonder whether um, in another way, uh, that level of kind of bluntness and whatever meant that many people who struggled in certain ways uh, were marginalised within our communities mm -hmm. or even actually left our communities entirely without us noticing mm -hmm. their going. Uh, and I also think that actually, uh, in part, the way that I've seen some people function in that space and able to deal with that is almost a turning off of their emotional selves. Mm -hmm. Um, which I don't think is always healthy or helpful uh, and, in fact, often has implications for children and grandchildren and oh, family it's, relationships and, and, and a whole bunch of things pastor, like that as well. If That's you've right. turned off your emotional self, it's, it's going to be tragic for yep. your um, for yep. the, for your I, I think that's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I think one of my reflections is that what we need to work out how to do is how to talk about this stuff in a healthy way and in a way that just doesn't lead into kind of deep self-pity Mm -hmm. which I think would be unhelpful and ungodly, mm -hmm. uh, but in a way that gives people freedom to acknowledge who they are and how they function as people, and then what to work out what to do with that in light of the gospel. Mm. Do you know what so, I mean? So you obviously changed job from the highly stressful team leader at the Campus Bible Study yep. to less stressful Matthias Media, then back to pastoral work, I presume more stressful than Matthias Media. Do you know? Oh, it was definitely like I, I. I mean, I moved into a place where I was basically two IC in that ministry. I did a lot of the training stuff. I was responsible mm. for um, an MTS training team that had maybe twenty plus mm. people in it. Mm. Um, there were lots of stresses yeah, 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 and strains yeah. in that job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then dean of students now at Moore College. Yep, ha that has its moments too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How have you... So, so some of it, though, I think it sounds like the, part of the way you've managed it is choosing the job that works, do you know, for you. Well, but I th then, think that there's, then there's a truth also, in that. How do you go about approaching the job that you're doing? Do you know? Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a dual question there. I mean, one of the things that I ask myself is if, if I had the experience and wisdom that I had now and I was thrown back into my kind of 20s self mm -hmm. as I took on that job mm -hmm. coming out of college, would I have survived? Mm -hmm. And the answer is I think I would have. Mm -hmm. Um you know, 
I don't know 100%, but mm -hmm. that's my guess. Yep. Uh, and uh, certainly lots of what I've done in recent years has been quite a lot more stressful. Mm. Um, I don't think, yeah, anyway, I, I, you know, I do a lot of preparation. I have my fingers in lots of pies. Yep. I'm involved pastoral with people. I'm involved in kind of writing all lectures kind of things, and yeah. speaking publicly and doing all that stuff. Um, I think part of what's happened is that God has helped me to unravel some of my ungodliness uh, in the process of learning how to deal better with my anxiety but realizing too that some of my anxiety is just me and being wired as me mm -hmm. and learning to accept that there's a reality about that, right? Mm. So um, let me try and give you an example of that. So one of the things that I realized um, after the event, um, when I first took that job, one of my deep kind of convictions was that compassion is really important for mm -hmm. a pastor. And when people come and speak to a pastor, you have to love them and loving them means being willing to lay down your life and do anything mm. for them. Okay, so I would speak to people who had come to me with terrible sadness in their life and brokenness mm. and family things and depression and whatever. And my immediate response was, nobody else has listened to them. They need to be loved. I need to spend more time with this person and meet up regularly with them and help mm. them out, right? Um, actually, that was an utter disaster. It mm -hmm. was an unutterable disaster um, because, not because in any individual situation uh, I was unhelpful, but basically, those things consumed so much of my mental and emotional and personal energy that it became harder and harder to do the other things that I was responsible for mm. as a pastor, like preparing to preach and preaching and l encouraging leaders and growing new leaders mm. and like managing the finances, managing the staff team. Ma like mm. There were lots of areas of my life, uh, and even in fact in my family life, but these things kind of grew and took a disproportionate amount of space. There were people who I should have said, I'm not actually in a place to look after you and help you. Mm -hmm. You need to go and find help and I can show you where and how to mm -hmm. find help. And let me introduce you to some other congregation members who will come and love you and pray with you and help you through this space. Um, but I can't do that for you because I actually have a whole set of responsibilities mm. that exist to a lot of other people at the same time. Mm. Uh, but part of the reason that I said yes um, was that I, I, f I actually felt like it was a godliness issue if I'm not willing to lay down my life mm. for this person. So I had this kind of, this picture of theology that reinforced my behavior. Mm. But some of the reason that I couldn't say no was that I was afraid of what they would say to me. Mm -hmm. and I was afraid of what other people would think of me if I was seen as nasty or horrible mm. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there were things about pleasing people and the way that I was wired and my need for affirmation that meant that I said yes to a whole bunch of things that I probably should have said no to. And part of the process of untangling over time, kind of post that period in my life, has been realizing that there were those parts of me that were unhealthy and unhelpful. And I needed to tackle, well, why did I need to be liked so much? Mm. Why was I so desperately worried about saying no to people um, and tackling them in the light of the gospel and in the light of God's goodness and in the light of the fullness of what God calls me to as a servant of his people? Um, and so I've actually changed certain things in my behavior. I will much more readily engage in conflict now than I used to. Mm -hmm. Now, I still get these funny feelings in my <laughs> stomach. And I know when I'm in a situation where, you know, where I'm about to have to disagree with you or something and I'll have all of those bodily responses. Yes. But rather than having them and then kind of chickening out and, and moving away... Yep. I've become better at going, that means that there's something that I'm anxious about and concerned about. I need to think about that and reflect on it and pray about it. And I also need to not necessarily automatically just run away from you, but maybe mm. I need to talk about what I think and feel and why that matters and why I might disagree with you. And interestingly, under God, as I've wrestled with those things over time, I have not become completely free of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But the episodes of kind of deep anxiety, that kind of clinical expression mm -hmm. of anxiety, have been much less frequent. And when they occur, they're less deep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, the other, th I, don't, I don't know whether you want to go here or yeah. not, but the other thing is that part of it also for me has been realizing that some of it is just bodily and somatic. And, and so when I get really tired, when I'm not eating properly, when I'm not exercising, when I'm not sleeping, then my body's systems, which do all the anxiety stuff, are triggered much more quickly yeah. and they get out of control much more easily. And so there are just disciplines about being human and creaturely, that means there are things that I have to look after and care for about who I am and how I live under mm. God, or those things are going to get out of control. Yeah. And so I mean, that's actually really important. We, we've talked about um, all the... We, we, we jumped straight from your story into the scriptures, but we didn't actually go to 
the doctor. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, look, and that's absolutely right. And I want to say, like, you know, I'm not a medical expert. That's not my field of mm. kind of study or expertise. So part of what I'm sharing with you is my own story and a lot of reading that I've done mm. in the area. Um, but there is a reality that this thing is part of what they would call your semi-autonomous nervous system. There are, there are things that happen in your body that happen automatically that are completely outside mm. of your control, which is really good in some ways, right? So the fact that your heart keeps beating even though you're not thinking about it, that's actually quite positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are other things. When your body gets kind of frightened by things or whatever, there are real responses that are automatic that you don't mm. control. And uh, learning to accept the fact that sometimes that's just part of being who you are and wired how you mm. are. And learning, how, well, what do I do when my body gets into that space and how do I respond to it? That is just part of being human. And there are some people for whom those things are so deep and the chemistry is so out of control that there are moments when the medication and the whatever is actually vitally important. It's part mm, of God's yeah. good gift to help us to get back into a space because what ha when you're in the deeply anxious space, you are not rational. Mm. Like I look at myself, I am not rational. Um, and I know I can't think as clearly. When I wake up at 4 a.m. and some conflicts happened the day before, and I realize that I've just been over that, that same scene about 40 times before I even mm. realized that I've done that. And I think, no, 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 that's not good. And I try to pray about it. And five minutes later, I realize I've actually <laughs> gone around another 40 <laughs> and whatever. There are things that are going on within me that are kind of, automatic and autonomous in nature mm -hmm. and it's actually helpful to just realize that about general life i think my favorite study at the moment dominic there's this guy over in israel um, who's done this study of israeli judges um, overseeing parole cases right, right? about 1200 cases yep. across the course of 10 months eight israeli judges with an average experience of 22 years right. which, like each person had at least 22 years mm. worth of kind of judicial experience and they would s see between 14 and 35 cases a day mm -hmm. and then what they did was they they controlled you know how s those statistical people control for crazy things mm. like how serious the original offense was and recidivism mm. and that kind of stuff and then they plot where in the day your case is seen and your likelihood of achieving parole. <laughs> oh, no. Right? And it looks, it basically starts at 70%, and then just before morning tea, it's just above 0%. And then they go for morning tea and it goes back to 65%, and then it drops off to about almost zero just before lunch, and then they eat lunch and it goes back up to 70%. <laughs> and then if you get, and so, like at one level, we're kind of like, this is outrageous, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but actually, it's fascinating. Even the most cerebrally able, most objective people yeah, that we right. can think of as being, <laughs> even how long it's been since they last ate is affecting how they respond to the world around about them. And actually anybody who's raised small children or like, you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're going yeah. off the wall. Uh, maybe they need a good talking to or maybe they just, just need, need some food <laughs> or they need to go to sleep or whatever else. And so we, we like to think of ourselves as unembodied, yeah. like we're just this floating brain that can control yeah. and be in control and we're just not. That's not who we are. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. yeah. Thanks very much for coming in. <laughs> My guest on The Pastor's Heart has been Paul Grimmond this afternoon. It's been great to have him. Look, I hope you can join us next week. Tim Clemens from Grace City Church is going to be with us, along with Stuart Starr um, from uh, New Life Church at Oran Park. We're going to be talking about um, setting the vision for the church. Uh, some people are really good at this. Some people are not so good at all. These guys are great, and I'm looking forward to learning from them. And uh, I'm hoping that you'll join us and uh, this will be good for all of us as we think about how to, where are we going as a Christian community under God? What do we think he wants us to do? And how do we actually lead the people in that direction, raise the resources, all that kind of thing next week on The Pastor's Heart. Mm -hmm.